This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers lectures 3 and 4 of Seminar 5. After posting the previous video, I realized that the term linguistic analysis often evokes associations with analytic philosophy, specifically logical positivism and ordinary language analysis. It's understandable that someone stumbling upon a video containing the term linguistic analysis might be even surprised, amused, or offended by the content that they're encountering in a video like this. It is remarkable that two philosophical traditions underwent a linguistic turn almost simultaneously. However, the origins of these two turns differ significantly. One of them arose from an effort to formalize language in a logically satisfying manner that accurately represents reality. The other emerged from a focus on relational contexts and social structures, exploring how meaning arises not merely from the reference of signifiers to signifieds, but also from distinctions among signifiers. In this regard, the latter linguistic turn, referred to as linguistic structuralism, share certain surface similarities with ordinary language philosophy, which emerged as a rejection of logical positivism and its representationalist approach to language. I use the term superficial advisedly here as, despite their shared emphasis on the practical application of language, these two approaches differ significantly. For instance, it's important to avoid conflating Wittgenstein's concept of a language game with Lacan's notion of the symbolic order. One crucial distinction lies in the fact that language games primarily concern the generation of word meanings through their contextual usage within a specific framework, a game. Similar to Lacan's theory, there is a separation between signifier and signified here. However, the focus is on meanings as they are constructed through situational rules that govern the production and interpretation of speech acts. According to Lacan, the role of signifiers go beyond the constraints of the specific language game or the synchronic rules, grammatical laws, and social context in which meanings arise. Instead, signifiers and the chains they form possess their own inherent logic characterized by their tendency to separate from one another, combine in new ways, and be substituted for others. These functions are not solely governed by the rules of the current game, but are intrinsic to language itself. Influenced, of course, by the historical background of the individuals employing these words, this historical dimension includes an internalized structure of authority of a symbolic order, uniquely instantiated through the subject's past. Consequently, these dynamics create a split within language itself, wherein intended usage and unintended messages coexist. To the best of my knowledge, ordinary language analysis does not acknowledge this split that is so crucial for psychoanalysis. This split represents a key feature of Lacan's concept of the subject, distinguishing between the speaking present, le dire du présent, and the present speaking, le présent du dire. To clarify, I propose an alternative translation here, with the former rendered as the speaking of the present and the latter as the present of the speaking. Although less concise, these translations may be clarifying. Lacan explains that the speaking of the present establishes the speaker's presence within the discourse, situating them in their current capacity as speaker. When discussing the present, one delves into how things are and the personal significance they hold for me. The present of the speaking seems to refer to the present of the one who is enunciating the discourse, specifically what exists now in the act of enunciation, which is not the same now as the one speaking of the present. Initially, and perhaps well beyond that initial exploration, this distinction is not entirely clear. It seems that the present of the speaking is a kind of articulation of what Lacan will later identify as the subject of enunciation. For our purposes here, the difference between these two marks a separation that establishes a division between ego and big other, a separation or split that is evident in language as I've already suggested. So in this context, the speaking of the present corresponds to speaking from the standpoint of one's ego, 
On the other hand, the present of the speaking signifies the position of the big other where speech originates, and thus holds its inherent nowness distinct from the now that is being spoken of. From all this, it shouldn't be surprising that Lacan claims that the Freudian experience demands a revised notion of the subject that surpasses the philosophical concept of the ego. In philosophy and many psychoanalytic approaches, the ego is often seen as an entity capable of synthesis, unifying our diverse experiences. However, the truth is that we consistently encounter inconsistencies in the reasons behind our acts. We act in ways that contradict our consciously held motives, revealing this aforementioned split. These contradictions arise because in the Freudian experience, we lack awareness of and are alienated from those underlying reasons for our behavior. Instead of the ego serving as the consolidating force of our experiences, the presence of these unfamiliar reasons introduces a concealed clandestine unity into what our egos perceive as a fractured and disconnected relationship to our conscious motives. This hidden unity is the unconscious, which possesses its own laws and structures, often manifesting in various phenomena such as symptoms, dreams, mishaps, and witticisms. However, Lacan adds that despite this multitude of expressions, there exists an underlying structure that forms the essence of this secret unity. Naturally, psychoanalysis aims to situate this diversity of manifestations within that structure, which is characterized by a repeating pattern of discourse between repressed subject and big other. In parts 2 and 3 of Lecture 3, as well as throughout most of Lecture 4, Lacan further expands on the principles underlying the formations of the unconscious. A significant insight emerges regarding how signifiers are displaced, combined, and substituted through the mechanisms of metaphor and metonymy. Lacan will here place greater emphasis on metonymy than he has in previous lectures, asserting that whenever we are dealing with a formation of the unconscious, we have to systematically search for what I call the debris of the metonymic object. In this context, the debris refers to the smallest units of a signifying chain, namely phonemes. The metonymic decomposition of phonemes was particularly evident in the example of Freud's own experience of forgetting the name Signorelli, as we discussed in the previous video. In Lecture 4, Lacan offers further clarity regarding the distinction between metaphor and metonymy. His usage of these terms can be perplexing as it diverges from their conventional definitions, as something I've said in previous videos. For instance, metonymy is commonly understood as substituting a part for the whole, exemplified by phrases like 30 sails for 30 ships. Yet we can see where this confusion arises in another example by Lacan, example that he's used before, his sheaf was neither miserly nor hateful. In this case, it may initially appear that sheaf refers to a part of the figure's attire, thereby metonymically signifying his entire being. However, Lacan asserts that this is not the case. According to his interpretation, sheaf functions as a metaphor, substituting for the signifier father and conveying notions of fertility and castration. The metaphorical nature of this line lies in the process of substitution where one signifier replaces another within a signifying chain. In contrast, metonymy involves a connection between proximal signifiers along the same chain, without substitution taking place. Furthermore, metonymy does not add any new meaning. When we say 30 sails, it does not provide additional information beyond what is conveyed by 30 ships. If anything, there may be a degradation or simplification of meaning. On the other hand, the usage of the signifier sheaf evokes a range of meanings that extend beyond the signifier itself. So metonymy concerns a relation of derivation, utilizing the contiguity within the chain for signifying purposes. As a result, meaning becomes less stable and more elusive. Only metaphor provides a point de capitaine, an anchoring or quilting point that partially halts the slide and provides a degree of stability. And we can see this most clearly when metaphor is missing, as in the clinical structure of psychosis, wherein the fundamental metaphor, the paternal metaphor, is repudiated, something we got into in Seminar 3. Now, I very recently encountered a personal example that I believe illustrates metonymy well. 
This morning, while dropping my daughter off at camp, we were attempting to cross a walkway when a vehicle blatantly disregarded us and sped past without acknowledging our presence. Naturally, I was furious, and a few choice words escaped my mouth, catching my daughter's attention, who is generally very attentive and loves to point these things out to us. As I took some time to calm down, I explained to her that sometimes I get so angry, it becomes challenging for me to let go immediately. In an attempt to lighten the mood and empower my daughter, I jokingly asked if she had any advice to help me chill out. To my surprise, she promptly retorted, put some ice in your mouth. This response brought a good laugh, and as I headed to work after dropping her off, it dawned on me that this exchange could be an example of a witticism through the use of metonymy. So initially, I unreflectively selected the phrase chill out as a metaphor for becoming less angry. The implicit metaphor is that anger is associated with fire or heat. My daughter, on the other hand, took the metaphor and literalized it by choosing a word closely related to chill, ice. Her choice of the word ice does not add any new meaning to my original metaphor. If anything, it seems to degrade its metaphorical nature by opting for a word that is semantically linked to chill rather than preserving its clear connection to anger. Furthermore, my daughter introduced another metonymic displacement by using the word mouth. Why did she choose the word mouth? Well, perhaps it's because that is the location where the fiery words originated. So naturally, she selected a term physically associated with speech. In this case, mouth does not appear to be used metaphorically as it does not introduce any additional meaning to speech. It functions much in the way 30 sails does for 30 ships. I use this example in part because it diverges from Lacan's focus on phonemes, which for me are always a bit abstract and confusing, and instead thinking about proximal relations in terms of semantics and physical contiguity. Despite this departure, I still think it applies, and I think it especially aligns with the emergence of metonymic objects. As we learned in Seminar 4, metonymy forms the foundation for the fetishistic displacement of desire, giving rise to what is referred to as the metonymic object, an object that produces the fetishistic object. So let's consider a hypothetical situation where later in life my daughter develops a persistent habit of chewing on ice without understanding the underlying reason behind this behavior. We could speculate how the act of chewing ice is metonymically linked to the father's angry speech. But let's be a little bit more precise here. The metonymic object would not be the ice. Instead, the metonymic object is perhaps the father's angry speech or the signifier anger, which becomes repressed. Just as in Freud's forgetting the name Signorelli, the metonymic object is hair, which is repressed in light of its relation to death, which then also leads Signor to be repressed and then substituted for other phonemes. But in that case, there's no clear metaphor that stops the sliding, that sort of uh, stabilizes the situation. The name is simply forgotten and not truly replaced. So when the repressed metonymic object makes its return, it resurfaces with additional layers of meaning, thereby functioning as a metaphor. So in this case, it's not sufficient to say that the ice is the metonymic displacement of the anger of the father, but also there are other um, signifiers that converge on the signifier ice to give it its power. And this convergence of things, the convergence that gives rise to the symptom, is uh, what makes it metaphorical. And this conforms with what Lacan asserts elsewhere, that the symptom is a metaphor. At the same time, there is an intimate relationship between metonymy and metaphor. Rather than being entirely distinct processes, we should understand that they are always intertwined when a metaphor is at play. Indeed, metonymy developmentally precedes metaphor. And it's because signifiers can be disaggregated and displaced that there is the possibility for the emergence of metaphor. As Lacan aptly states, in short, there would be no metaphor if there were no metonymy. And we can see this in an earlier example with the case of familiar, which 
is identified as a metaphor, but it is born out of the metonymy of the disaggregating of phonemes that gave rise to this new word. Along with liking, sharing, and subscribing, you can financially support this work using the super thank you button below this video. To be an ongoing supporter of this work, I have a Patreon page where I offer video transcripts, unedited materials, and prioritize questions and comments. The link is below. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. And as always, thank you for watching. Until next time, be well.